The story we will play with today is extremely famous and for very good reasons. Rather than being confined to the pages of history book, it has become part of American popular culture. In 1993, when the super successful Got Milk advertisement campaign was launched, it dedicated its first commercial to this very story. If you are not from the United States, this pop cultural reference may escape you, and perhaps you may not be quite as familiar with the story itself. In either case, it's a great tale that I'm excited to explore today. On July 11, 1804, two men who had been political enemies for over 15 years, Aaron Burr, who was at this time the vice president during Thomas Jefferson's first term, and Alexander Hamilton, who had been the very first Secretary of the Treasury for the United States, and had been George Washington's right-hand man for quite a while, plus he was the leader of the Federalists. These two politicians left Manhattan in separate boats in the early hours of the morning. They landed in New Jersey and met each other for a duel. They pulled out their pistols and shot at each other. Now let's try this again until it really sinks in. These are two of the leading political figures in the United States of the day. They decided they were not content trading insults and trying to slam each other's policies. It's normal in politics. But they met in a formal duel, drew their guns, and fired with life-changing results for both of them. We're so used to people in politics saying the nastiest things about each other with impunity. We're used to presidential debates where they tear each other to shreds, and then they shake hands and smile. So to me it's sobering to remember that it wasn't always so. In a not-so-distant past, war could lead to very tangible actions. Insults to one's honor could and did lead to individuals sometimes deciding that unless an apology was forthcoming, then the time was for wars was over, and the time for guns was at hand. The Burr-Hamilton duel, in fact, was far from the only case of political fights abandoning the reign of metaphors and turning literally into fights. Duels in the United States in the 17 and 1800s had become a way to test political opponents. Most of the time they weren't lethal. People died in less than 20% of duels. But if somebody backed away from a challenge, they would be forever considered a coward and their public reputation would be ruined. Duels for the most part were about proving a man's willingness to die for his beliefs. So if you'd allow me a brief tangent, let's look at some examples. First and foremost, the seventh president of the United States, Andrew Jackson. Jackson was in a record of 13 duels. In 1806, before the height of his political career, Jackson got into a duel with a certain Charles Dickinson. Dickinson had accused Jackson of cheating over a bet on horse races between his father-in-law and Jackson. He had also insulted his wife, which was probably not a good idea considering Jackson's temperament. Since dueling was illegal in Tennessee, they crossed the border into Kentucky. Now, Dickinson was an expert marksman, and he drew first and shot Jackson. He had aimed for the heart, but the sideways stance meant it was pretty hard to hit the heart, so he narrowly missed it and ended up breaking Jackson's ribs. Many were amazed that Jackson could stand and shoot back. Later, after the duel, Jackson stated that he would have hit him even if Dixon put a bullet in his head, he would have somehow still found the energy to shoot him back. Now, due to the very perverse ritualistic structure of duels at this time, the men took turns shooting at each other. So now it was Dickinson's turns to wait still while Jackson took aim and shot. A few people later criticized Jackson for killing Dickinson, saying he could have shot in the air or only to wound him. But Jackson said, hey, this guy here, he, shoot, he shot to kill, so I did the same. So Dixon died, and uh, Jackson survived, carrying a bullet in his chest for the rest of his life as a result of it, somehow still able to kill his opponent despite this. Here is the case of another American president, this time Abraham Lincoln. 
He accepted the challenge once by a certain James Shields, who was to become a U.S. senator later on. Lincoln didn't trust his chances with guns, so he challenged to using broadswords while standing on opposite sides of a really small stream. The reason for the weird rules is that Lincoln knew he had a huge reach advantage and wanted to milk the advantage for all he could. Since he was the one being challenged, it was up to him to pick the choice of weapons and setting, and that's why he chose this particularly bizarre dual setting. Now, as they were about to start, Lincoln reached on the other side of the stream and chop a branch of a tree close to Shields. Kind of, sh it was a way to show off his reach. Shields at the point realized just how bad things look for him, and he suddenly remembered that this dueling business was really just all a big misunderstanding, and he had always liked Lincoln, and there was no reason to have any bad blood. So he gave up, and they ended up not fighting. Let's move to another example. Henry Clay, Secretary of State, Senator, and at one point presidential candidate. He was in a duel in 1809 with a political rival, which resulted in a wounding but no killing, and he was also in another duel later in his life. Or, if you're not just talking about presidents or wannabe presidents, here we have New York Supreme Court Justice Brock Holst Livingston. He killed a man in a duel over politics just a few years before becoming a judge. And beside dueling, dueling weren't the only form of political violence that could take place between sort of leading politicians. One of the most famous cases in American history goes back to 1856, when in the midst of a vicious debate about slavery that was raging through the country, Senator Charles Sumner gave an extremely harsh speech against the slavery and against the authors of a pro-slavery bill, Senator Stephen Douglas, and Andrew Butler. Butler's cousin was a man by the name of Preston Brooks, who really didn't take this too well, and he considered challenging Sumner to a duel, but according to the rules of the time, duels were for gentlemen of equal social standing, and he considered Sumner not worthy of this honor. So instead of challenging to a duel, along with a friend by his side, Brooks approached Sumner in the Senate while Sumner was sitting at his desk, and Brooks proceeded to beat the living hell out of him with a cane. Sumner was hit so hard that his vision went black. He tried to get up, but Brooks kept hitting him while Sumner was trapped at his desk. Blood covered Sumner's face. Finally, he was so desperate to escape that he managed to break the desk which was bolted to the floor in order to try to run away from the beating. But that didn't do much for him, because the beating continued, as Sumner was blindly trying to find a way out. Brooks even broke his cane on, on his head, but kept beating him with the remaining piece. Eventually Sumner passed out unconscious, and yet Brooks kept beating him still. Some senators tried to step in, but Brooks' friends prevented them. Congressman Lawrence Keith, in particular, drew a gun in an effort to convince good Samaritans that perhaps they had better things to do than get involved. Eventually, Brooks decided it was enough. By this point, the floor of the Senate chamber was soaked in blood. Southern representatives made drinks out of the pieces of the cane that were left on the floor and attached them to their neck chains to be worn in solidarity with the beating. Brooks was actually quite happy with the idea that his cane was treated like a sacred relic, and in the days to come, many people in the South sent him new canes, some with inscriptions hit him again, just to make sure he wasn't running out of the necessary tools to carry out the job. Sumner survived, but he ended up with PTSD, brain trauma, and chronic pain. The point of this whole long detour is to show you that our duel, the duel that we'll be looking at for the rest of the episode, is far from the only episode of political violence pitting against each other to high-level politicians in the 1800s. The duel itself is easily summed up. Two men met, they both fired, one fell down, one went home to have breakfast. 
but to fully appreciate what was going on, we really need to look at everything at the roots of the duel. So it's time to introduce our main historical actors. Alexander Hamilton was born in the mid-1750s. There's some disagreement there whether he was born on January 11th, 1755 or 1757. Incidentally, for those of you guys who are keeping tab, that's my birthday. Well, not the year, but the day, yes, January 11th is it. He was born on a Caribbean island in the British West Indies. His father was a Scotsman, and his mom was a French woman whose main claim to fame was a reputation for an impressive degree of sexual promiscuity. Today would hardly raise an eyebrow for a woman to enjoy sex with several lovers over the years, pretty much the norm in the Western world for women to have boyfriends. But back in the mid-1700s European world, a woman with such a reputation was considered not too different from a prostitute. The man's former husband at one point had her jailed for, I quote, whoring with everyone. She was divorced from her first husband and never legally married Alexander's father when Alexander was born. In other words, Alexander Hamilton was born a bastard, and as such he was at the bottom of the social order, was not allowed to attend schools run by the Church of England, and he was looked down by people of the upper classes in multiple ways. This is clearly a very unlikely background for a guy who was going to become one of the founding fathers of the United States. Most founding fathers were wealthy, upper-class people. Hamilton was an outcast. Some of his political rivals, later in life, regularly insulted him about his origins. President John Adams, a man Hamilton hated even though they belonged to the same political faction, reciprocated the contempt and referred to Hamilton as a bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. And when Hamilton ended up at the height of his power, Thomas Jefferson remarked, it's monstrous that this country should be ruled by a foreign bastard. And if things were bad enough for him when he was born, they were about to get a lot worse. When he was ten years old, his father left the family, and his mother died just four years later. In his writings, he sometimes mentioned his father in affectionate terms, but he never had a single positive mention of his mother. So after both parents died and he remained as an orphan, he was sent to live with a cousin. But Hamilton's luck was basically the equivalent of Murphy's Law. So within a few months, his cousin committed suicide. Some people say he shot himself, some people say stabbing. The historical record is unclear, but the reality remained the same. The only thing that Hamilton inherited were some books that no one wanted, mainly classics such as Plutarch and other ancient authors. And these books in some way proved the turning point. From them, he gathered that intelligence was the only thing that could save him from his condition, and a brilliant intellect was going to be his saving grace. His unusual intelligence allowed him at only 15 years old to become the head clerk of a shipping company. He was very talented in business, but this job was a bit troubling for him because he hated slavery, and yet he had to deal with it to survive since it was part of the company's business. As a young teenager, he wrote poetry, he published articles on the island's newspaper, and by 1773, two patrons impressed with his intelligence sent him to college in the United States. Hamilton arrived in the U.S. just about the time when tensions between American settlers and the British crown had reached a boiling point. He joined the Continental Army in 1876, and again, thanks to his intelligence, he worked his way into becoming one of George Washington's top aides. Washington picked him because of his bravery, intelligence, and devotion to his principles. He brought him in his inner circle. This is where his luck changed, and Washington choice to bring him in among his close confidant was the foundation of Hamilton's future fame and political career. The experience in the army, seeing the army undersupplied and underfunded, made Hamilton mad 
against the weakness of Congress, and he began speaking out against it. What he wanted was to create a better system of government. His ideal of government was largely shaped by this very dark view of human nature that he fostered. He felt human beings are basically horrible, and the only way to ensure freedom is with a strong government and a system of laws preventing the natural human evil to be unleashed in a cycle of the strong preying on the weak. So, frustrated with the government of his time, he wrote to a friend, I quote, I'm a stranger to this country. My talent and integrity are unrewarded. Our countrymen have all the folly of an ass and all the passiveness of sheep. They are determined not to be free. I hate Congress, I hate the army, I hate the world, and I hate myself. It's safe to say that Hamilton probably had better days than when he wrote these lines. But in these lines you can catch much about the man. Very pessimistic about humanity. Always this feeling of being unappreciated, and as such having this driving desire to build a name and reputation for himself. And also a borderline manic depressive state in the intensity of his feelings. It's common opinion that he was a genius, but it's also common opinion that he had major tragic flaws as a human being. The author, Arnold Drogo, referred to him as a flaw giant, two words perfectly applied here. Now, despite his not exactly cheerful disposition, Hamilton managed to marry a woman from a very rich family. Her name was Elizabeth Schuyler. Her father was a general in the Revolution. And somehow Hamilton managed to impress her father, despite his complete lack of money, and the fact that the father was actually very elitist, and so not the kind of guy who was going to accept, as uh, we mentioned before, a foreign bastard as his son-in-law. But apparently he did, so that speaks volumes about what Hamilton was able to do to impress him. Largely this happened because... Uh, Everybody knew that George Washington had a soft spot for Hamilton, and that clearly went a long way. So this was one of the many doors that Washington opened for him. Not so indirect way, Washington's support led to this high-born lady accepting to share her bed with a bastard from the Caribbean and to have his kids. Hamilton led the first charge at Yorktown, so that speaks quite a bit about his behavior. In fact, many people commented about his almost insane, suicidal desire to gain honor despite possible consequences. So he just silenced his survival instinct and he was the very first to reach the British lines. On that day, the stars were on his side. He survived the charge and gained even further reputation for bravery. After the war, Demonstrating yet again both his single-minded drive and his intelligence, Hamilton went through the 1700s equivalent of law school, which was typically about three years of studying, in a six-month period. Washington always cared for him, and kept him under his wing. So it's in part thanks to Washington's patronage that Hamilton became part of the Constitutional Convention. Those among you who like the idea of state power may not be so fond of Hamilton, since he was one of the main voices pushing for a strong central government rather than separate states. Hamilton had wanted the presidency and the Senate to be roles that would be lifelong. He was kind of against checks and balances. He liked the idea of this strong central power, uh, quasi-dictatorial in nature. Again, I quote from Hamilton, just to give you a window into, it, into his thoughts. I am not much attached to the majesty of the multitude. I consider them in general as very ill-qualified to judge for themselves what government will best suit their peculiar situations. So, translating it in simpler language, basically Hamilton considered democracy a disease. He had no faith in citizen participation in government, 
and so it's not exactly a surprise that this type of comment it, it's probably safe to say that this did not do wonders to endear him to some people it's actually probably safe to say that most people didn't like him they saw him as arrogant they saw him as uh, uh, pushing this uh, semi-dictatorial type of government but the fact that Washington trusted him made other people respect him regardless of his uh, somewhat less than personable nature along with James Madison and John Jay he wrote the Federalist Papers to argue for a strong central government against the fears of people who were concerned that central government would be another oppressive regime just like the one they just overthrew so to the opposition saying that what he was proposing was an elitist kind of government hamilton replied yes we need an aristocracy to be running our government an aristocracy of intelligence integrity and experience so Hamilton had really no problems with the Republican criticism on concentration of wealth in the hands of the elite. He was a big friend of the wealthy and not exactly sympathetic to the masses. Regardless of whether you agree with his political ideals or not, Hamilton did play an important role in getting the Constitution ratified, and he was rewarded for his service by George Washington with the post of Secretary of the Treasury, which was clearly a very high office in the very first cabinet in the United States. Now, at the founding of the United States, the initial plan was to have no political parties. The goal was to just have individuals run as individual candidates, not as members of particular parties. The reason being was to avoid artificial factionalism and people voting for party loyalties rather than because they felt that a certain policy was truly the best idea which sound great because i mean even today you see people who they would vote one thing or its exact opposite it all depends on who are the other guys supporting it if somebody supported they'll vote the opposite even though it may be what they want it, it's very bizarre the whole system in the u.s but and for that matter not just in the u.s in many parts of the world the same thing happened in any case regardless of the original intention the quickly alliances developed and these alliances also quickly gave way to formal political parties now the name of the parties have little connection with modern political philosophies of respective parties one of the main parties in fact was referred to sometimes as the democratic republicans or in some cases just the republicans they were seen as more the people's party However, their leaders were just as rich and just as uh, the elite of society as the leaders of the Federalists were seen as the more kind of upper class type of party. In his role as Washington's right hand man, Hamilton made a deal with Jefferson. He gave him support to the idea of moving the capital away from New York, which was the first capital, and it's something that Jefferson wanted to move away from New York in exchange for the federal government assuming state debts. Why was this important? Because this move, this idea of the federal government taking the debts accrued by the states, ended up giving more power to the federal government, which is something that Hamilton wanted. In terms of his personal life, by this time Hamilton had five kids with his wife. By the time he's done, he'll, he'll have eight overall. Now, despite partially shaping the destiny of the United States and impregnating his wife every other minute, Hamilton apparently still had some spare energy. So he ended up having an affair with a Maria Reynolds. Hamilton was known as a womanizer. Martha Washington had nicknamed her cat, who was notorious for chasing every female cat around. She had called him Hamilton. Many rumors suggest that Hamilton had an affair with his sister-in-law and with several other women. Now, this Maria Reynolds is important because she had visited Hamilton's house when the kids and his wife were gone, and she told him a sob story about how her husband had run off with another woman and left her penniless, so she asked for his help. Hamilton promptly went to visit her to bring her money and quickly began an affair with her. 
soon after this, this uh, Reynolds, uh, Maria Reynolds' husband, wrote Hamilton, acting all mad, he found out about the affair and he was all mad, but he would let it go if Hamilton would pay up. So Hamilton began paying an extremely expensive bribes. At some point it was half of Hamilton's yearly salary. And the arrangement was that he could keep sleeping with her, though. So some people think that Maria Reynolds' husband, James, well, we know he was a criminal, but some people think that he kind of put up his wife to it in order to blackmail Hamilton. Reynolds began boasting around that the Secretary of the Treasury was giving him insider's tip to speculate on government securities. He was eventually arrested, and they found on him money that Hamilton had given him to buy his silence about the affair. So the question on whether Hamilton was into a partner in these illegal activities came up. He was accused of corruption, and because of this, he was approached by three members of Congress, including the future president and Jefferson's friends, James Monroe, which is something very important, as we'll see later. They were investigating whether Hamilton was giving this guy insider's information plus Congress money. Hamilton offered proof of his infidelity, he admitted to the affair, and he admitted to being blackmailed. But he was adamant about the fact that this was his money, and, you know, he was like, no, my public honor is intact, I just cheat on my wife and I'm being blackmailed, but I didn't really cheat on Congress. So it was kind of strange how this played out, because he admits having an affair with a married woman, but he insists that he didn't really do anything improper in his political career. Somehow he believes that his confession will absolve him of wrongdoing now and none of these will ever be heard from again. And yet one can tell but smile just how naive he is about the political game. He obviously doesn't understand how the game works. I mean, the idea that this will be a big deal for Hamilton's political career. Five years later, the same story would be picked up in the press by a journalist accusing him of insider's trading. And this was the reason why it was picked up, because it was um, five years later, Hamilton was in a big rivalry with Jefferson, and Jefferson probably told uh, some of his allies in the press to dig this up and use it against Hamilton. Hamilton power had been growing under Washington, he had pushed uh, adopting a national currency and create the ancestor of the Federal Reserve. So this push for strong central government made him several political enemies. Thomas Jefferson in particular saw Hamilton as a threat to individual liberty. Both of them, both Hamilton and Jefferson, were big on the idea of freedom, but they had radically different ideas about what best, you know, what freedom actually meant. One believed that freedom could only be guaranteed by a strong government. The other believed that freedom is guaranteed by having a weak government. So clearly they did not see eye to eye, and this brutal feud developed between the two. Both started slander campaigns in the press and so on and so forth. So Jefferson Henchman used the evidence of the Reynolds affair to tarnish Hamilton's reputation, you know, just in case he decided to run for president, just a good smear job there. And again, five years later, Hamilton confessed the affairs, this time in public, not just to this small congressional committee, and he admitted to, yes, I had an affair with this woman in order to shoot down the charge that he had uh, essentially stolen government money to pay off the bribes. Jefferson supporters just couldn't believe their luck. Here was the Federalist leader openly doing an insane amount of damage to himself. He didn't think twice about causing immense pain to his wife to keep his reputation as a public official. He was so intent on protecting his public image that he thought nothing about his admitting to private infidelities, nor realizing that in politics the two are linked, you really can't separate the two very well but he clearly wasn't up to this part of the game yet, he wasn't quite savvy on this. In any case, by 1796, after Washington stepped down as first president of the United States, 
Hamilton returned to practicing law. He was running kind of low on money. And despite this, despite the fact that the law um, practice clearly paid him handsomely, he was making some of his money back, even when technically he was out of politics, Hamilton was still seen as the leader of the Federalists, now that Washington had stepped down. Just a couple of years later, when it looked like the United States was going to end up possibly in a war with France, Washington came out of retirement and nominated Hamilton his second in command for running the army, which is something that did wonders to rehabilitate Hamilton after the humiliation of the Reynolds affairs. Even other Federalists didn't like Hamilton. John Adams, for example, the second president of the United States, really didn't like him. When John Adams was running for re-election in the year 1800, Hamilton wrote some pamphlets demolishing Adams' reputation. He, Adams considered Hamilton, I quote, a man utterly devoid of moral principle. The rivalry was, between the two was so nasty, and Hamilton in particular was the most active of the two in this. He wrote a whole series of letters viciously attacking Adams' characters, and these again played into the hands of his enemies. Aaron Burr managed to get his hands on these letters and leak them to the press, thereby showing the infighting that was going on among, uh, among the Federalists. And as a result of this, Hamilton indirectly favored Adams' rivals in the 1800 election, namely Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. All the infighting upset the moderates who blamed Hamilton for the loss in the 1800s. Quite a few people began to see him as a loose cannon, as unstable. And in some ways, Hamilton, with this fight with Adams, began the collapse of the Federalist Party. He kind of forced this internal division that existed, that was simmering, but being brought to the light made it very hard to reconcile. So Hamilton basically destroyed the, the house he had built due to his personal rivalry with Adams. Noah Webster, oh, in case the name sounds familiar, because besides being a Federalist, he's the guy with most of our dictionaries in the US, that's where the name comes from. Noah Webster mentioned that Hamilton's ambition, pride, and overbearing temper would make him, and again I quote, the evil genius of this country. So that's saying a lot. Most of them, just about everyone, considered him a genius. You know, nobody had anything to say about uh, his intelligence. You know, he was clearly very, very talented. But sometimes this was an intelligence that didn't always work for his benefit, or even for the benefit of those close to him. He was smart, but safe to say, probably not wise. Well, so much for Hamilton. Let's take a look at the other big main character in our story. In plenty of ways, Aaron Burr is the exact opposite of Hamilton. He came from the aristocracy. You know, Burr's family had been made of New England Puritans, very strict about matters of religion. His ancestors had arrived in 1630, and his father had been a president of Princeton University. His grandfather was the Jonathan Edwards, who had been instrumental in shaping the Great Awakening of 1735. His cousin was president of Yale. So, you know, we're not exactly talking about the bums on the street here. We're talking about the elite of the elite. Burr was really not interested in a lot of what his family was doing. Particularly, he had little space in his life for the severe gloominess of the Puritan worldview. He was much more interested in having a good time. He loved the philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who argued that morality should be based on what creates the most happiness for most people, and that the key goal in life is pleasure. To the sermons about hellfire and damnation, Burr preferred hunting, drinking, and women. And women definitely returned his attention, since Burr was known to be particularly charming. 
His wife died in 1794, and both before and after, Borrow was known to have had many love stories, and according to many ladies, he had illegitimate kids with many of them. As vice president, as he will be starting in the year 1800, he had mistresses in at least four different towns. Clearly, Victorian morality was still a few decades away. And by the way, it makes you wonder where he found the energy. Seriously, mistresses in four different towns? Well, good for him, I guess. One of his early biographers remarked that he was, I quote, truly surprising how any individual could have become so eminent as a soldier, as a statesman, and as a professional man, who devoted so much time to the other sex as was devoted by Colonel Burr. For more than half a century of his life, they seemed to absorb his whole thoughts. His intrigues were without numbers. Part of the reason why women liked him a lot was that he was pro-women rights long before this was fashionable. He treated women very well and as actual people with something to say, rather than simple playthings designed exclusively to birth his kids, have sex with him, clean his house and fix his food. He was very much one of the few Americans who were in favor of women's education. He had taught his daughter Theodosia personally, and as a result she was extremely well educated. When he had married, this was a rare case of a guy who actually loved his wife at a time when really marriages were not about love at all. He gave every opportunity to his daughter as if she were a son. And contrast this with Hamilton's vibe in a letter that here we see to his fiancée when he was still not married. I quote, I am restrained by the experience I've had of human nature. Some of your sex possesses every requisite to delight and inspire friendship, but there are too few of this description. Do not, however, suppose that I entertain an ill opinion of your sex. I have a much worse one of my own. Again, it's not that difficult to see which guy you'd want to sit close to at a party. Burr very much enjoyed life. Hamilton had the reputation of a bit of a killjoy. But despite all these differences, they also had some similarities. Despite the upper-class background, Burr had had a rough childhood. First in 1757, his father had died of smallpox. His grandfather, the famous Jonathan Edwards, and his mom had been vaccinated, so they felt safe, right? You're vaccinated, so all is good, right? As it turns out, vaccines were not quite as effective as advertised, since both of them died of smallpox just a few months later. So like Hamilton, Burr had no parents from an early age. He enlisted in the army during the revolution, just like Hamilton had done. In 1775, he had been under Benedict Arnold in attacking Quebec, and was next to General Montgomery when he was killed in this battle. Burr tried to rescue the general's body, and or at least that's the legend, there are disagreements exactly about his role in the battle, but he definitely was close to Montgomery. His conduct in the war was widely praised, though. Despite this, he was unlike Hamilton, he was not exactly on friendly terms with Washington, he didn't like him too much. After the war, both Burr and Hamilton moved to New York City, and they both became lawyers. This was at a time when there were very few lawyers in town, so as a result of this they hanged out in the same circles. Burr even was the one who represented Maria Reynolds in her suit for divorce, which has led some historian to think that maybe he had an affair with her, which was yet another reason why Hamilton hated him. But this of course is complete speculation, we don't know. We do know that he represented Maria Reynolds, we do know that he was big on trying to seduce every woman with a pulse, but that's as far as we know. Burr's first open conflict with Hamilton took place in 1791. At that time, Hamilton badly needed as many senators to support his policies as possible. So he had tried to get his father-in-law to win the New York State Senate seat. His father-in-law made no mystery that he considered himself above common people. 
you know, in many ways he was a traditional aristocrat. So not surprisingly, most people didn't like him. Burr was the man running against him, and he was much more personable, at least by comparison. Burr was not all that controversial policy-wise, but he was well hooked up with businessmen financing his campaign, and he was seen as charming by voters. Hamilton had offended a powerful New York family, the Livingstones, by not supporting one of their own during an election after they had helped him. This was definitely one of the biggest mistakes of Hamilton's political career. So the Livingstones allied themselves with the governor, who was uh, named George Clinton, not the guy from Funkadelic, that's a different George Clinton, and they worked to block Hamilton's father-in-law to win a second term in the Senate. Burr had been Hamilton's ally against Clinton for a while, but he had got turned off by Hamilton's arrogant manners and his my way or the highway kind of attitude. To him, politics were a mean to gain power, more wealth, more prestige, more women. That's what Burr was into. Hamilton hated Jefferson, but he despised Burr even more, since he believed he had no morals to speak of and he was only out for himself, which was well, not exactly untrue. Hamilton commented on Burr. I take it he is for or against nothing, but as it suits his interest and ambition. And it is true that Burr really just wanted to become richer and more powerful. That's basically what it was about. Burr's reply to criticism of this kind, such as the one leveled by Hamilton, was Great souls have little use for small morals. Check that out again. Great souls have little use for small morals. Somehow I can't tell but snicker at this. Makes me. Some other people have quoted him slightly different. Great souls do not worry themselves with little details, but you know, you get the idea. Similar type of thing. In another occasion, Hamilton had said, I feel it is a religious duty to oppose his career. Well, despite Hamilton's religious duty, Burr won anyway. So from this point on, Hamilton made it, made it his life mission. Well, maybe not his life mission, but he made it one of his priorities to try to oppose Burr's career in any way possible. If this early match went to Burr, there would be two more going Hamilton's way. Round two of the Hamilton-Burr political rivalry was a big one, and it came with the presidential election of 1800. Burr ran with Jefferson on the Democratic-Republican ticket, against John Adams, who was the Federalist incumbent. The understanding between them was that if they won, Jefferson would become president and Burr vice president. As mentioned earlier, even though both Hamilton and Adams belonged to the Federalists, they hated each other. Hamilton was desperately trying to get a different Federalist candidate other than Adams to be elected but all he achieved was create an internal fight among the Federalists and their indirectly helping the Democratic Republicans. The Electoral College rules at the time gave each elector two votes for president, with the candidate receiving the second most votes becoming vice president. The Republican Party plan was to have 72 of their 73 electors vote for both Jefferson and Burr and with one of them voting only for Jefferson. So Jefferson would get the presidency and Burr the vice presidency. However, someone clearly must have not gotten the memo, since Burr and Jefferson tied with 73 votes each. The United States Constitution stated that in the event of no candidate winning a majority, the election was moved to the House of Representatives, which was controlled by the Federalists. Even in the House of Representatives, the first result was a tie, and the tie continued for five days. There was a very real chance that Federalists may vote for Burr just out of spite for Jefferson, and thereby complicating things among Democratic Republicans. Hamilton hated Jefferson and opposed his political views passionately, but he hated Burr even more, so to the point that he even saw Jefferson as the lesser of two evils. Until the year 1800, Hamilton had been nice enough to Burr's face, even during the earlier political rivalry. They had worked together on a low case, their daughters were friendly to each other. 
Hamilton and Burr actually won a fraud case that won the biggest judgment awarded by an American court up until that time. And yet at this point, Hamilton dropped the mask and he threw his political weight to oppose Burr's shot at being president. Again I quote from Hamilton, Burr loves nothing but himself, thinks of nothing but his own aggrandizement, and will be content with nothing short of permanent power in his hands. Some authors argue that Hamilton hated Burr because he was afraid that he could switch parties and become the new Federalist leader. Regardless of the reason, Hamilton convinced one congressman to switch vote so that Jefferson would become president and Burr vice president. There are some historians who question how big of a role Hamilton really played in preventing Burr from reaching the presidency. And instead, some of these historians argue that Burr just played his cards very poorly. Burr could have tried to jockey for votes by lobbying with congressmen still on the fence, but he didn't. He didn't want open war with Jefferson. He said he was loyal to Jefferson, and yet he never said that if the Federalists voted for him, he would refuse to serve, as Jefferson had wanted him to do. So he didn't really do enough to avoid Jefferson's being mad at him, but he didn't do enough either to get any votes. He just remained in New York without getting into the fray. Delaware's congressman, James Bayard, was disgusted with Burr's timidity, so he voted for Jefferson. Bayard said that Burr's lack of drive here, and I quote, gives me but a humble opinion of the talents of an unprincipled man. Despite this possible success, depending on which historian you listen to, Hamilton's political career was going down the drain. Shortly thereafter, in 1801, Hamilton was humiliated when he couldn't get elected his sister-in-law husband the, to governor of New York. Hurting Burr, in some way, was the last thing in which he could flex his muscle and play a big political role. So here we saw Hamilton was able to influence the outcome of a presidential election, again, at least if we listen to the historians who believe that he played this role, and at the same time demolishing his own party and much of what he stood for. This in some ways Hamilton wrestling with his own demons. You know, Hamilton was clearly intolerant of opposing viewpoints. He was very determined, very sure of his conclusions and quite vocal in expressing disagreement uh, against other politicians. He completely lacked any type of diplomatic tact. Had he played poker, he would have been terrible, because he always wore his emotions on his sleeves. In an environment in which people took seriously their reputation and were ready to take offense in heartbeat, Hamilton's trash talking was almost guaranteed to create enemies for him. Historian Carl Walling writes, Hamilton, he was a great statesman and a terrible politician. He could not make himself speak what he thought was untrue. He was too honest, too candid. People could provoke him by attacking his honor in such a way that he became extraordinarily self-destructive. Hamilton, in many ways, is a tragic figure because the love of honor, which is the source of his greatness, I would argue, is completely consistent with Greek tragedy, also the source of his downfall. Speaking of honor, pride, politics and tragic consequences, a prime example of this will affect the Hamilton family shortly after the 1800 election. In 1801, Hamilton's eldest son, 19-year-old Philip, who was a recent graduate from Columbia College, got into a public confrontation with one of Thomas Jefferson's supporters, a Republican named George Eaker. Earlier in that year, Eaker had made a speech in which he said that Jefferson was the savior of the nation and that Hamilton would have been okay with violently overthrowing the government, which clearly was quite a serious charge. This didn't go so well with Hamilton's son, so Philip along with his friend Richard Price, went to Eaker's box at the Park Theatre and confronted him in heated fashion. This resulted in Eaker calling them damned rascals 
which apparently wasn't as comical back then as it may sound today, but was actually taken as a serious insult. So they both challenge Iker to a duel. That, I guess, is a perfect example of how times change. Can you imagine somebody using the words damned rascals and somebody else getting so upset as to be ready to draw a gun and just shoot each other in a formal duel? Times have indeed changed. In any case, on November 22nd, Price and Deaker went to New Jersey for their shootout. The reason why they went to New Jersey is because dueling was highly illegal in New York. Luckily for both involved, they had terrible aim, so they shot at each other four times, but missed every single time and decided to call it off. The week, however, was not done for Eker, when the very next day, on November 23rd, he met Philip for their duel. Hamilton had told his son to throw away his fire. Throwing away one's fire meant shooting in the air or into the ground, and was basically a way to abort a duel. It was a common tactic to keep your honor by showing up, but not really trying to kill each other. So you shoot into the ground or into the air to show, I'm here, but I don't really want to go through with this, I don't want to kill you. William Pitt, for example, the Prime Minister of England, had thrown away his fire in a duel. Some friends of Philip had asked, uh, they basically suggested him, hey, why don't you apologize for your poor manners at the theater, because you were a little out of line. That way, Iker can retract his insult, and then you guys don't have to fight each other. But Philip, for whatever reason, he actually wanted a duel. On November 23rd, their seconds gave the command to begin, but neither Philip nor Iker shot. They just stood there and faced each other for a minute. So it seemed like things were going, where these guys were just showing up for the duel, but neither one actually wanted to shoot the other. But just when it looked like this duel was more of a ritualistic performance than an actual duel, Philip lifted his pistol. No one knows what prompted this, why he was doing it, but this clearly forced this rival to lift his own pistol and fire, and his aim had apparently improved since the previous day, since he shot Philip and killed him with one shot. Philip survived for about 24 hours before eventually died in agony the next day. His father, the elder Hamilton, was crushed. He had put all of his hopes on his eldest son, so he was psychologically wrecked by his death. They say that at his funeral, Hamilton nearly collapsed. One of his college roommates has stated, never did I see a man so completely overwhelmed with grief. And Hamilton apparently wasn't the only one in his family to feel the loss of Philip in strong fashion, because Hamilton's daughter Angelica suffered a nervous breakdown, went insane, and was really never the same afterwards. So this is easy to imagine that Philip's death weighed heavily on Hamilton when the time came for his own duel. Speaking of which, it's time to look at the genesis of the duel that is the subject of our episode. It begins yet again with politics. Aaron Burr was becoming aware that Jefferson would not have him for vice president for a second term. Jefferson was apparently still sore about the fact that Burr had nearly took the presidency away from him in 1800, so he didn't want him as vice president for the next term. Jefferson in public stated how they were still friends, but it was pretty clear that he didn't trust Burr anymore. Jefferson worried that Burr could be a political competitor. There were quite a few people who wanted a third party, in between the extremes of the Federalists and the Republicans. And Burr seemed perfect for that, because he was friendly with some Federalists, he clearly was a Republican, he was a bit more moderate than Jefferson himself, and many people on both sides. Also, Burr was more popular with the military than Jefferson was. But precisely because he was a moderate, in this kind of extreme political climate, neither Federalists nor Republicans fully endorsed him. They both had some reservations about him. But regardless, some people wanted Burr to become more aggressive against Jefferson, and Burr was biding his time. He wasn't really going after Jefferson in an open fashion. There was some tension there. You know, both uh, Jefferson and Burr had some of their friends 
write kind of trash talking the papers about the other but they did it through intermediaries so that they could pretend to still be friends when meeting each other face to face Burr, however, was unaware of just how determined Jefferson was to destroy his political career. Jefferson's public declaration of friendship may have not fully convinced Burr, but it did mask the extent of Jefferson's hatred. Knowing that his vice presidential gig was up, Burr asked Jefferson for a job as ambassador to France, and Jefferson took an extremely roundabout way to say no. So Burr realized there really is no future for me in the Jefferson administration, so his one option to keep his political career alive was to run for governor of New York. So the 1804 election was when Hamilton began his third battle with Burr. In case you have a short attention span, here is your reminder that the first one was the Senate race when Burr had gone against Hamilton's father-in-law, the second one was during the presidential election of 1800, and here is the third one, in 1804, when Burr is running for governor of New York. Hamilton was a little bit worried that, as his own party, the Federalists, were beginning to collapse, some of them were looking for a new leader, and a few of them thought that Burr, as a moderate Republican clashing with Jefferson, could actually switch and become a Federalist leader. So he would, there were quite a few Federalists willing to vote for him during this election. This is why Hamilton instead launched a campaign against him. He looked for other Federalist candidates to take votes away from Burr, and he was even willing to support a different Republican candidate, just as long as Burr wouldn't get elected. So over and over during these days, Hamilton went on record giving anti-Burr speeches at dinner parties, public celebrations, and these speeches were the seeds of their duel to come. At this time there was a plan circulating among some politicians to initiate a secession of New England from the Union, and Burr showed himself willing to discuss this plan. Uh, he didn't fully support it, but he gave them hope that maybe he could be on board. So Hamilton started speaking up against this plan, some people think mainly because Burr would have been the leader that the conspirators would have pushed forward rather than himself. So some historians think he was jealousy more than anything, others think he was a matter of principle. Regardless, the end result of the 1804 election will be that Burr will lose his bid to another Republican candidate named Morgan Lewis. And as a result of this, Burr was super depressed. It looked like this was the end of the trail for him, the end of his political career. He really had no future. Clearly he was angry. Probably he was looking for a scapegoat and someone to blame. And it's not that much of a stretch to figure out that one man would be at the top of that list. The man who, according to some, had robbed him of the presidency and was now tarnishing his reputation with some very public attacks, just to make sure that he didn't win the election, which, in fact, he did not. Now, some people argue that Hamilton had not played as big of a role as others attribute to him in making sure that Burr would lose the election. Again, this is speculation, because historians are arguing about these things all the time, and there is no way to know for sure. But we do know that Burr was definitely in a bad mood, and was looking for some kind of revenge. The seeds of the duel are found in a letter that was published in the Albany Register, indicating that a certain Dr. Cooper had heard Hamilton make very negative remarks against Burr, and he also stated that he could provide a, I quote, still more despicable opinion, which Hamilton had uh, expressed toward Burr. A Burr supporter, a lawyer named William Van Ness, on June 18, 1804, arrived at Hamilton's law office with Burr's letter in hand. The letter, I'm going to quote extensively, forgive the convoluted language, but that was just the way this guy spoke in the early 1800s. The letter summed up goes something like this. Sir, I send for your perusal a letter signed C.H.D. Cooper, which, though apparently published some time ago, 
has but very recently come to my knowledge. Mr. Van Ness, who does me the favor to deliver this, will point out to you the close of the letter to which I particularly request your attention. You might perceive, sir, the necessity of a prompt and unqualified acknowledgement or denial of the use of any expressions which could warrant the assertions of Dr. Cooper. I have the honor to be your obedient servant, Aaron Burr. It's funny how these guys express themselves. In a letter that basically is calling Hamilton out and beginning postery for a duel, Burr signs himself, I have the honor to be your obedient servant, Aaron Burr. Yes, I have the honor to be your obedient servant and I'm dying for a chance to shoot you in the heart, but that's how these guys play the game. Hamilton must have known that Burr was looking for a duel, but he didn't want to give him the satisfaction of apologizing. And yet he couldn't really deny having said the terrible things about him either, so he was kind of evasive in his answers. Hamilton asked for specific expressions. He said, you know, either quote what it is that I'm, I'm said to, you know, what is that I'm accused of having said, or don't bother me. You know, just don't make it specific or don't bother me. Hamilton's reply was kind of dismissive and definitely hostile. And really this boiled down to the fact that Hamilton couldn't apologize to Burr, or he would lose influence. You know, he was trying to avoid the duel, but was also fatalistic about it. I quote from some of his writings, I trust, on more reflection, you will see the matter in the same light with me. If not, I can only regret the circumstance and must abide the consequences. To say that Burr was not satisfied with Hamilton's replies, to put it mildly, he said that his vagueness was no explanation at all, and he added, political opposition can never absolve gentlemen from the necessity of a rigid adherence to the laws of honor and the rules of decorum. I neither claim such privilege nor indulge it in others. The common sense of mankind affixes the epithet adopted by Dr. Cooper, the idea of dishonor. It has been publicly applied to me under the sanction of your name. The question is not whether he has understood the meaning of the word or has used it according to syntax and with grammatical accuracy, but whether you have authorized this application either directly or by acting expressions or opinions derogatory to my honor. Your letter has furnished me with new reasons for requiring a definite reply. So here Burr is basically asking Hamilton flat out if he ever said anything demeaning to his honor. And Hamilton, much like he did after the first exchange, keep dancing around the point. You know, he really can't deny it because he can't say, no, I never said anything offensive to your honor because he had, and he would be a lie that would eventually blow up in his face. People would accuse him of him being a coward, of lying, just in order to get out of a duel. You know, even though Hamilton had kept a semi-polite front with Burr in his face-to-face -face meeting, uh, related to their law practice, during their social visits, his hatred for Burr over the past 15 years in politics had been vicious and extreme, even for Hamilton's notoriously harsh standards. Even Hamilton's grandson and biographer will eventually write that Hamilton's attacks inevitably led to a duel. The only surprising thing was that Burr had waited so long before a challenge. Burr, on the other hand, had never really spoken badly against Hamilton in the open. But regardless of the previous history, Hamilton picked up as an intermediary an ex-soldier named Nathaniel Pendleton. So Hamilton gave him a letter as a reply to Burr's second letter. And it read something like this. Sir, your first letter, in a style too peremptory, made a demand, in my opinion, unprecedented and unwarrantable. My answer, pointing out the embarrassment, gave you an opportunity to take a less exceptionable course. You have not chosen to do it, but by your last letter received this day, containing expressions indecorous and improper, you have increased the difficulties to explanation, intrinsically incident to the nature of your application. If by a definite reply you mean the direct avowal or disavowal in your first letter, 
I have no other answer to give than that which has already been given. If you mean anything different, admitting of greater latitude, it is requisite you should explain. Now, if I were the recipient of this letter, I would challenge Hamilton to a duel just for the damn language used. This is just the most convoluted and annoying letter I've ever read. But I'll set my own personal judgmental self aside and let's go on with the story. I mean, let's look at this realistically. Burrard asked Hamilton, did you say anything insulting to my honor or not? It's not really a complicated question here. It's a yes or no kind of thing. So the fact that Hamilton danced around the answer in this legal lingo rather than replying obviously did not do wonders to calm Burr down. So basically, Burr told his friends that Hamilton had mistook Burr's kindness in not reciprocating insults for weakness, and he had only grown bolder over time. But, as Burr now stated, these things must have an end. Now, that's a language that's anything but ambiguous. It's pretty clear where Burr is going with this. So, Burr issued an ultimatum, saying that Hamilton, either he would have to state he said nothing injurious to his honor, or the duel would be on. So Pendleton believed that Hamilton would actually do that, and Hamilton tried to come somewhat close to apologizing without actually doing it. You know, the fact is he couldn't. There was no way he could do it without everybody looking down upon him as, as a liar, essentially, as having backed down from a challenge. So Bird did not accept these efforts, and he seemed very determined to have this duel, and Hamilton wasn't doing a whole lot to avoid it. So Burr sent Van Ness to issue a challenge to Pendleton, and now it was on. So in the days before the duel, Hamilton wrote a document explaining himself for posterity regarding this duel. Uh, this was entitled Statement on the Impending Duel with Aaron Burr. In this document he said that he didn't want the duel, because of his, I quote, religious and moral principles. He stated that he never wanted to kill anyone, which was a little weird because he was not really all that religious, and he had killed in war, uh, he had killed people in war prior to this. He had also challenged people to duels as late as four months earlier, and so this would be in self-defense. So really this statement doesn't make much sense because he was not, clearly not against dueling, he was not against killing people, and his religiosity didn't really seem all that developed, so it's a strange kind of statement, but let's see, we'll worry later about what it may mean. In more believable fashion, he stated that he didn't want this duel because of concern for his wife and kids, and he wanted to make sure that he could pay back some of his creditors. He also stated he didn't want to kill Aaron Burr, that their rivalry had been purely political but he felt that he had to step up or he would lose face. As uh, John Quincy Adams stated years later in regard to this um, writing by Hamilton, Adams wrote, Should he decline to meet Colonel Burr, some doubt at least of his personal intrepidity would be entertained by the man of military mind. He could no longer expect to be the favorite candidate for the chief military command. It's in this remark that has set some historians' mind spinning, thinking that both Burr and Hamilton were losing in politics, you know, their political careers for both of them was declining, so possibly both of them were hoping for some kind of military command, and perhaps the duel between the two could be construed as part of this rivalry in jockeying for a position in the military. Again, this is speculation, we don't know that, but it's an interesting speculation. Hamilton in his document wrote that he was planning to throw away his first fire. Again, I quote, I have resolved if our interview is conducted in the usual manner, by the way, interview is the term that they use for duel, I have no idea why, but that's how they do it. I have resolved if our interview is conducted in the usual manner, and it pleases God to give me the opportunity, to reserve and throw away my first fire, and I have thoughts even of reserving my second fire. Some people think that this declaration that he would throw away his first fire was really an insurance policy, hoping that he would come back to haunt Burr 
if by any chance Burr was able to kill him. I mean, this document would never be published if he was to survive, it was really only if he was killed. So some people think that he was just in hope to ruin Burr's career even further in case Burr was victorious. Because this story is not quite weird enough yet, on July 4th, both Hamilton and Burr attended an annual dinner of the New York chapter of a society they both belonged to, which was named after Cincinnatus, a famous Roman general. They actually sat close to each other at the dinner. I mean, think about the weirdness of that situation. Here are two guys drinking and eating at the same table, and yet both knowing that they are, at that very moment, they are planning on meeting with guns drawn the next time they see each other, and that they are going to try to kill each other. During this occasion, Hamilton sang a song, which was written by General James Wolfe, before getting killed while attacking Quebec in 1759. And the lyrics are quite haunting, so I'm going to quote some of them. Why, soldiers, why? Should we be melancholy, boys? Why, soldiers, why? Whose business it is to die? And in a few lines later it say, Damn fear, drink on, be jolly, boys. It's but in vain for soldiers to complain. Should next campaign send us to him who made us boys, we are free from pain. But should we remain, a bottle and a kind landlady cure soul again. Considering the context in which this song was sung, this is really quite haunting. Now, Hamilton had quite a few duels before, but all of them resulted in no shootings. They were either called off at the last moment, or they showed up and fired, um, threw away the fire, that kind of thing. There was one that he had uh, with James Monroe. Remember I told you that Monroe's role into the Maria Reynolds affair would prove important? Well, Hamilton was mad about the fact that he believed Monroe had leaked confidential information about his affair with Maria Reynolds. Plus, they were political rivals. Monroe didn't like him and believed that Hamilton had caused this recall as diplomat to France at a time when there was a purge of non-federalists from government jobs. So after some nasty words exchange, Hamilton had challenged Monroe. Under the file's small word, Monroe had asked Aaron Burr, to be his second, and Burr convinced both men to call it off. Monroe had a reputation as an expert marksman, so Hamilton was only too happy to agree to call the duel off. But the fact that Burr was the guy, avoiding, helping this duel to be called off, kind of avoiding the whole thing, is bizarre considering that Burr himself now ends up in a duel with Hamilton. Burr also had his share of duels. He had, uh, he had a duel with uh, John Barker Church, who was uh, Hamilton's brother-in-law, over Church's accusation of Burr's corruption in 1799. Their duel had not been just purely ritualistic. Church had shot Burr, and his bullet had gone right through Burr's coat, but didn't quite hit him. After this, Church had apologized, admitting he had no proof for his allegations. Both Hamilton and Burr, kept their plans for a duel secret and did not tell their families. Both of them wrote letters to be delivered to family members if they were to be killed, Hamilton to his wife and Burr to his son-in-law and to his daughter. Burr's relationship with his daughter is interesting. She was probably the person he loved the most in all of his life. But again, let's not get lost in sentimentality and let's get back to this manly business. So shortly after dawn, on July 11th, Burr and Hamilton boarded separate boats in New York. They crossed the Hudson River and they met at this prearranged uh, dueling spot in New Jersey. This spot was, uh, this was, this spot was notorious, like anybody who wanted to have a duel would go there. It was kind of like the, the ground for people from the New York area to go have their duels. This was incidentally the same spot where Hamilton's son Philip had died not so long ago. To make the whole thing even creepier, Hamilton decided to use the very same pistols that had been used in the duel in which Philip lost his life for his own duel this time. Now, either Hamilton was really the least superstitious man on earth, 
or he was suicidal or something because really that I means there's something quite creepy about using the very same guns that have been used to kill your son. Nathaniel Pendleton's Hamilton Second wrote the rules for the duel. The rules were something like this. Number one, the parties will leave town tomorrow morning about five o'clock and meet at the place agreed on. The party arriving first shall wait for the other. Number two, the weapons shall be pistols not exceeding 11 inches in the barrel, the distance 10 paces. Number three, the choice of positions to be determined by lot. Number four, the parties having taken their positions, one of the seconds to be determined by lot, after having ascertained that both parties are ready, shall loudly and distinctly give the word present. If one of the parties fires and the other one is not fired, the opposite second shall say one, two, three, fire, and he shall then fire or lose his shot. A snap or flash is a fire. These were the official rules for their duel. Burr, his second, and a few others arrive at 6.30 a.m. Hamilton, his second, and their entourage arrived a few minutes later. Now, clearly this duel, like any duel, was delicate business because it wasn't really always clear what the intentions were. You know, so many times the people coming up for the duel didn't really intend to kill each other. As I mentioned earlier, they would actually stop short of shooting each other. And really these duels were more elaborate performances indicating one's willingness to die for one's honor rather than actual efforts to kill one another. It was more like animals displaying aggression rather than fighting to the death. But obviously, just like it happens among animals trying to establish rank, sometimes the display goes further than intended and people do get killed. Here, Bor and Hamilton saw each other, they formally saluted, they measured a distance of 10 paces, which is roughly about 30 feet, and as mentioned earlier in regards to the rules of the duel, the seconds would ask them if they were ready, and if yes, they would answer present. After that, they could fire. Both of them adopted a sideways stance, since it offered as little target as possible, so obviously it made sense. In the version of the affairs later offered by Burr and by his second, Hamilton had made a big show of testing the aim of his pistol, adjusting his spectacles and other actions that were clearly not the actions of a man who was about to shoot into the ground, but rather seemed to be the actions of a man who was trying to prepare to accurately hit a target. So once they were given the command, both men fired at right about the same time. Again, the later reports will be contradictory, they will state different things, but some reports indicated that Hamilton fired in the air, but rather than the typical shooting straight up, which is what you do if you want to throw your fire away, he had shot in the close vicinity of Aaron Borsad. If this, as Hamilton's people claimed, was Hamilton's way of throwing away his shot, he really didn't follow protocol since he was, wasn't clear enough and Burr was not a mind reader, he could not know what Hamilton was trying to do, you know, the, the bullet came much too close to him to be called the uh, shot that was thrown away. Burr did not have an, any kind of ambiguity about this, he shot Hamilton in the gut, breaking his ribs and damaging his internal organs. Immediately Hamilton collapsed. Burr walked toward him without saying a word before being ushered away by his second. He went home and decided to have a giant, I have cheated death, so I'm going to taste every morsel of this kind of breakfast. In the meantime, they had left, uh, the, both Hamilton and Burr had left this doctor by the name of David Hozak close to the rowers that had brought their boats to this place just a distance away, so he was not, so he would later say that he was not directly involved with the duel. But once Hamilton fell down, they immediately called the doctor. The doctor arrived and noticed that Hamilton was not breathing. So they took him to the boat. He seemed like he was already dead, you know, he seemed like, but once they took him to the boat, he woke up, started breathing again and kind of came back to. So 
Hozak's account states that Hamilton told him that his gun was still loaded to be careful and that, you know, everybody, he wanted to, with, with his dying breath, he was trying to make a point that he did not fire, he did not want to fire. But then again, that wasn't exactly true because he did fire. So whether this was a lie or whether his firing was by accident, hard to tell. But that's what he said. When Burr later learned of this, of this idea that Hamilton had intended not to fire and stated this, his comment was laconic and to the point. He said, contemptible if true. As mentioned earlier, modern historians have debated to what extent Hamilton's statement and letter really represent his true beliefs, and how much instead this was a deliberate attempt to ruin Burr's reputation in case Hamilton was to be killed during the, during the duel. Burr himself said this much. He said that Hamilton's declaration that he was going to throw his fire away was just pure hypocrisy set up to put him in a bad light for winning the duel. If Hamilton's intentions were ambiguous, not so with Burr, since he had stated in very clear terms that he planned to kill Hamilton. Regardless of the intentions, Hamilton was taken to the house of a friend of his, William Byard. Hamilton asked for Benjamin Moore, who was the Episcopal Bishop of New York. Hamilton, as we said, he wasn't the most religious guy in the world, but he still was religious and he wanted communion. Moore, however, said no, since he was wounded in a duel, he was never a member of the Episcopal Church, so he's like, why should I give you communion? But eventually, after they negotiate a little bit, he agreed to do it. Hamilton managed to survive for over a day in agonizing pain, with all of his family surrounding him. And think about that for a second. None of his family even knew that Hamilton was going to participate in a duel, see? So since imagine getting that message where somebody can knock on your door, say, oh, remember your husband or father, depending on which member of the family may be. Well, it turns out he was in a duel this morning and he's dying right now. So when I come by to see him, that would sort of jolt your day right there. Hamilton eventually died at 2 p.m. on July 12. It's at this point that a letter that had been written by Hamilton to his wife was finally delivered to his wife. The text of the letter goes something like this. This letter, my dear Eliza, will not be delivered to you unless I shall first have terminated my earthly career, to begin, as I humbly hope from redeeming grace and divine mercy, a happy mortality. If it had been possible for me to have avoided the interview, my love for you and my precious children would have been alone a decisive motive. But it was not possible, without sacrifices, which would have rendered me unworthy of your esteem. I did not tell you of the pangs I feel, from the idea of quitting you and exposing you to the anguish which I know you would feel. Nor could I dwell on the topic, lest it should unman me. The consolations of religion, my beloved, can alone support you, and these you have a right to enjoy. Fly to the bosom of your God and be comforted. With my last idea, I shall cherish the sweet hope of meeting you in a better world. Adieu, best of wives and best of women. Embrace all my darling children for me. Ever yours, Alexander Hamilton. So now that Hamilton is dead, is this the end of our story? Almost, not quite. There's a bit of an afterwards to this. The Federalist Party was already in trouble following John Adams' defeat against Thomas Jefferson in the 1800 election and was even more in trouble with the, lo the loss of Hamilton's leadership. Granted, Hamilton was already beginning the decline of his political career, but he was still a big player among the Federalists. His funeral was a huge event. All businesses in New York closed down for the day. The ships in the harbor lowered their flags and fired their cannons. Lots of New Yorkers wore black on the left arm for 30 days after this. There was a huge backlash against Aaron Burr. Burr was initially indicted with murder in both New Jersey and New York. The charges were eventually dismissed, but his political career was ruined. For a few more months, Burr was still vice president of the United States. 
And a few months later, at the farewell address in the Senate, actually Burr delivered this very passionate, emotional speech that moved many people to tears. With his political career apparently over, Burr decided to meet with General James Wilkinson, who at this time was Commander-in-Chief of the Army. Wilkinson is a shifty character, to say the least. He hated Jefferson, but... It is the test to see if you have been paying attention so far. In light of the fact that you know that Wilkinson hated Jefferson, how do you think Wilkinson behaved toward Jefferson in public? If you replied that he acted as if they were best friends, you have just passed the test with flying colors, since the norm in the politics of the time was a perfect reflection of Don Vito Corleone's advice, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Many historians believe that Wilkinson was trying to get Burr on board on a plan to conquer Spanish lands in the West using the militia in Kentucky and Tennessee. Burr could act as the political leader, while Wilkinson would be the military leader. To make things even messier, Wilkinson was suspected to be an agent for the Spaniards, but, and it turns out it was actually true, but he was actually double-crossing them. So here you could have, you know, Burr as vice president of the U.S., colonel in the American Revolution, Victor, and if the plan was to come through, he would become this victorious commander over the Spanish army in Texas. He could then appeal to the Mexicans as a liberator from Spain. And maybe the territory of Louisiana, where there was a lot of unhappiness with Jefferson politics, would succeed as well. And some people suggest, not unreasonably, that Burr may have thought that the conquest of Mexico would have triggered a New England secession that we have mentioned earlier, which in turn would have left Jefferson with very little, without New England, without Louisiana, without the West that Burr was going to conquer. The timing was actually pretty good. Just a few years later, Mexico will indeed begin a revolution to gain independence from Spain. So Burr started making an overture to the British, trying to get their help for the, this plan. In the Western Territories, the killing of Hamilton had actually earned Burr some sympathy points, since in the West most people didn't like Hamilton very much. Hamilton had pushed for the National Bank and some of the associated land speculative practices, and so most Westerners were not big fans. So people in the West like Burr. Andrew Jackson, for example, who will later end up becoming President of the United States, was ready to raise troops to go against the Spaniard, so he likely would have been on board with Burr's plans. In the meantime, however, General Wilkinson had been appointed a territorial governor and this was making him lots of money, so by the time from their first meeting when he and Burr had met the first time, by now he kind of had changed his mind. He was not into this uh, revolutionary plan as much because he had more to lose. On top of this, the death of Prime Minister Pitt made it very unlikely that Burr would be able to receive uh, the British support that he craved. Burr still managed to raise about a thousand men, but without British support, Wilkinson decided that the odds were not so good, and getting paid by the Spaniards and staying on Jefferson's good side was a much better bet for him. So he betrayed the plan to Jefferson and arrested some of Burr's men. Which is funny when you think about it, because Wilkinson is the guy who started the whole plan, but now he's acting all indignant of like, these crazy men are trying to do this terrible thing, and he's denouncing them to Jefferson. Burr himself was arrested, and he was brought to trial for treason, which is quite serious business. Jefferson made no mystery about the fact that he wanted to see Burr hang. Lucky for Burr, Chief Justice John Marshall, who was Jefferson's enemy, was in charge of the case. The federal attorney for Virginia, George Hay, was in charge of the prosecution. Hay was a true Jefferson loyalist who had once hit a journalist in, on the head with a stick for suggesting that Jefferson had had kids with a slave woman. In the meantime, in this political carousel that will be the trial, Andrew Jackson went around giving pro burr speeches and preaching against Jefferson. The grand jury was all formed with 
just about every member of the grand jury was a supporter of Thomas Jefferson. So the political element of this uh, trial was obvious. But Marshall let Burr challenge and disqualify most of them. So it was basically this contest between Jefferson and Marshall, with Burr being the pawn in between them. One thing that hurt the prosecution was the fact that the main witness, General Wilkinson, was not there at the start of the trial. So Marshall actually allowed Burr to subpoena Jefferson to show up and for the case. Now Jefferson said, I'm going to release all documents pertaining to this, but I have matters of national security to attend to, so I can't show up. Wilkinson, however, arrived and gave a terrible performance on the stand. You know, he ended up admitting on the stand that he had known about the conspiracy a lot earlier than he had announced it, which in turn doesn't reflect very well on him. Burr was eventually sent to trial, but was found not guilty. So this big showdown between Marshall and Jefferson was won by Marshall. Despite having saved his neck here, because he literally could have been hanged, Burr was quite depressed with the fact that he really saw no future in his political career. So he traveled in Europe for a while. He kept trying this, to keep this plan in the back of his mind. He kept trying to revive it somehow, but he found no success here. He eventually came back to the United States in 1811 and things, if at all possible, turned even uglier for him. His young grandson died at that time. His daughter Theodosia, in mourning over the death of her son, decided to go to New York to see her father. So on December 30th, 1812, she boarded a vessel called the Patriot in Charleston. But the ship never arrived in New York. The rumors were that they were killed by pirates or they died in a shipwreck. Actually, these are not just rumors. These are the main two historical possibilities that have been pushed back and forth. We know that the ship never arrived, so really the options weren't too many. Either a shipwreck or a pirate attack. Both things seem quite possible considering the context of the time. Theodosia's husband died at 37 years old as a result of his heartbreak and losses over the death of his own son plus his wife. Burr decided to return to law practice and adopted a lot of kids. Some people say that some of these kids he adopted, maybe they were actually his, uh, his own kids who had been illegitimate all this time. It is said that toward the end of his life, hearing of some Houston leading Texans to beat Mexico, he supposedly said, you see, I was right. I was only 30 years too soon. What was treason in me 30 years ago is patriotism now. Now there's some debate on whether he actually spoke these words or not. In some way they were almost too perfect. Um, but, you know, maybe. Uh, speaking of other quotes that have been attributed to him and they may or may not be true, there's some debate about this one as well. The story goes that he read a novel by a certain Lawrence Stern, who preached this very live and let live kind of philosophy. And supposedly, Burr stated, Had I read Stern more and Voltaire less, I should have known the world was wide enough for Hamilton and me. Again, awesome quote. Is it true or not? There's some debate about it. Burr eventually died in 1836. Unlike Hamilton, he never bothered to ask for communion. When the minister asked him if he believed in Jesus, Burr supposedly replied, on that subject, I am coy. Now, this wraps a rather bizarre tale from a time when it was only mildly weird for two among the most powerful politicians in the United States to decide to settle their rivalry with guns in formal duels. Most people who look at the passing of that era, when duels were in fashion, as a step away from barbarism and toward a more civilized society. Perhaps they're right. But living as we do in an age in which any internet discussion, it could be about politics or it could be about whether you prefer cats or dogs, quickly degenerates into all-out verbal wars in which the nastiest things get to be said. In some way, part of me misses the idea that people would have to think twice before insulting someone 
unless they were ready to put their lives on the line. Plus, the 12-year-old in me can't help but think that duels would do wonders to ignite American passion for politics. Merge politics with the UFC, or better yet, merge politics with gladiatorial combat. Imagine a cage fight between presidential contenders. Ralph Nader sword fighting against the Monsanto CEO. Uh, Bernie Sanders with an axe going after Donald Trump equally armed. The Bush and Clinton clans meeting at dawn, OK Corral style, to settle their grievances. If any of this happened, the abysmally low American interest in politics would probably spike overnight. Thank you so much for staying with me for this episode. A couple of quick things to help and make sure that the show remains viable for quite a while. The first and easiest thing would be if you can please do your Amazon shopping using the Amazon link on the historyonfirepodcast.com website. Really just a couple of extra clicks for you and it helps me a whole lot. In case you go there and you do not find the Amazon link, uh, it's simple. It's probably because you have an ad block on, so you can either make an exception to that for the website, which would be the easiest thing, or shoot me a message and I'll let you know alternate way to tap into an Amazon link. Again, your effort in this regard is deeply, deeply appreciated. Also, a huge thank you to the sweet folks who have been donating. There's a donate button on the website that's connected to my PayPal. Some people have been using it and that's been very, very sweet. Also for our audience members, as I mentioned in the introduction, Audible.com is offering a free 30-day trial. So just go to audible.com forward slash HOF and browse the over 180,000 audio programs. Download the title that you are interested in. You can do this for free and start listening. It's that easy. Also, please check out dsgear.com. I use either their backpacks or computer bags every single day of my life so I can vouch for their extremely high quality. Also check out omnit.com, O-M-N-I-T, dot com forward slash history. It's almost impossible to try to sum up Omnit in a few sentences since they carry a whole variety of products I love. Lately I've been particularly intrigued with their steel maces which are glorious pieces of workout equipment that I've been using religiously during the breaks from researching new History on Fire episodes. As I mentioned in the past, if you are in dire need of more Bolelli voice in your ears, you can check at danielebolelli.com. I have uh, under the store, I have a lecture series about Taoism that I've created. I put the link in the episode notes in case you're interested. There's seven hours plus of material. So in case you decide to check it out. Granted, it's not history, it's a little more philosophy than history, but it's out there. Having said that, uh, what else is there to say? I would say, oh, there's an interest in the next few episodes of the show. They are all going to be somewhat related. At least the next four, maybe five, depending on how long the material is. If you want to find out a little bit about what the immediate future holds for History 